Hi, my name is Sam Tate. I'm the Associate Director of Clinical Ultrasound at Metro Health, and thanks for joining us for the Game Changer Critical Care Ultrasound Conference of 2019. Today, I'd like to talk to you about point of care transesophageal echocardiography. So we are going to talk about how to use this in our critical patients and give you some tools to make this seem as seamless as possible from your already wealth of knowledge for transthoracic ultrasound. So I got a chance to do my fellowship out at UC Davis and got to work with the cardiac anesthesia group there and learned how to do transesophageal echocardiography. So I'm hoping to share with you today a little bit about what they taught me and also how we can utilize this skill down in the emergency department or in the critical care setting. I have no financial disclosures. Okay, so we're going to be talking today uh, really about the basics of transesophageal echocardiography. We're going to get you used to using this new probe and teach you how this is no, not terribly dissimilar from the transthoracic you've been used to, except for some points of the probe itself and the insertion. So I want to make a distinction between comprehensive versus point of care transesophageal echo. It's really the difference between what our consultants do and what we do. The advantages of transesophageal echo over transthoracic. We'll talk a little bit about safety with this new probe, and we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about probe maneuvers and how to acquire the actual views that we're looking for. And finally, we'll talk about focus TEE in the emergency department. This is a pretty new area of publication, and there are several papers recommending a couple of different ways of doing this. Most commonly, a three view or a four view for assessment in your critical patients. So what is transesophageal echocardiography? Well, it's largely looking at the heart the same way you've been doing, except for we're going to be coming at it from the posterior side using this transesophageal echo probe. So this probe was really designed to fit down in the esophagus, so it's a narrow cylindrical long tubing that houses a small micro um, transducer. And it has a really unique property in that the crystals within the transducer at the distal tip way down here can actually spin about 180 degrees. And that is gonna allow us to rotate the probe. Now we're all typically used to rotating the probe in our own hand, but in this case, there's limited space within the esophagus, so the probe is going to do it by itself. So there are really two umbrellas of transesophageal echo evaluation. The first one is going to be comprehensive diagnostic or perioperative TEE. So this is what our consultants typically do, either when you order a transesophageal echo for cardiology or when they're doing it in the anesthesia OR. And it's really comprehensive. It goes through 28 views and uh, it has the additional uh, advantage of being able to guide intraoperative procedures. Now they're going to go through everything. They're going to go through the systolic function, the diastolic function. They're going to go look at each valve, look for regurgitation, anything on the valves like endocarditis. They're going to look at the atrial appendages. So they're really going to look at a comprehensive look at everything and try to identify any problems that could be going wrong. So this is in contrast to what we're going to be talking about, which is a focused or point of care transesophageal echo. So these answer focused, goal-directed questions that directly guide or challenge management. All right, if this sounds familiar to you, this is exactly what we're doing with the rest of our point of care ultrasound. So the... Don't be too scared about the 28 views that cardiology and anesthesia are typically doing. We are going to use a limited number of views that are analogous to, and you should be easily able to transition to interpreting these views in the same way that you would the transthoracic echocardiography. So really, why should we do transesophageal echo when we already know how to do transthoracic? So the argument today and why I think this is really valuable is it can actually bypass air in the lungs and the stomach. So the patient population we're gonna be talking about is in patients under CPR or in the peri-arrest setting. And it can be very difficult to look through uh, into the heart because of air. 
So this is a view of a patient under CPR. And I would argue this is a pretty darn good view. We're looking from the transthoracic window um, and we are trying to see the heart as best we can during CPR. So you can actually see the right ventricle pretty well, the left ventricle pretty well. You can see fluid that we're instilling and some bubbles in it. So this is a pretty decent view, but when we stopped doing CPR, we were really whited out by air. So in our critically ill patients, sometimes the view is unobtainable in about 30% of that population. And in our sickest respiratory patients who might be undergoing CPR because of that, uh, we may miss and not be able to obtain a view in as much as 85%. So this is really limiting our traditional way of uh, assessing the heart during CPR or the peri-arrest period. So we need a different way of doing this. So TEE really allows us to do a couple of things. It really has a great ability to determine, determine cardiac activity really during CPR or especially during pulse checks. You can diagnose reversible causes and there's some good data on that. We can actually monitor chest compressions. So this is a image of a transesophageal window and we'll talk about what specifically this window is in a little bit. But you can actually see the sternum moving and pushing against the right ventricle and we can actually watch how well people are doing CPR, which is pretty neat. We can also monitor our responses to interventions because we will have access to this view all the time. It's not going anywhere. The probe is staying in place. And finally, it's out of the way of compressions. There is no more getting gel all over your hands while you're doing CPR. We're not trying to find towels in the middle of CPR to try to wipe it off so people aren't sliding across the chest. So this makes it really slick for uh, being able to evaluate the chest while you're taking care of these critical patients. So let's take a minute and talk about TEE safety. So this is an inherently invasive procedure. We are putting this big esophageal probe into the esophagus, and we wanna make sure this is safe for who we're doing it on. So proper patient selection is really what we're gonna be talking about. So in the emergency department, what has been recommended is doing this under CPR. So patients who are undergoing CPR are the ones we're gonna be selecting as our patient population. Now this may move to a kind of a peri-arrest setting where we're doing it on patients who are going to arrest, but the current recommendation from ASEP is that we should be doing these on intubated CPR patients. And there's some suggestion that you may wanna consider if TTE is inadequate for the patient. And this can probably be a clinical decision, uh, not necessarily something that you have to do first. So there's some hard stop absolute contraindications. Really, you're looking for esophageal disruption. So if there's a history of stricture, TE fistula, pre-existing esophageal trauma, which hopefully you'll know about either from a quick chart review or from EMS presentation, this is something that we shouldn't be doing a transesophageal echo in someone like this. And we should be doing these all in intubated patients. So if they lack a definitive airway, as far as we're concerned, from the critical care or um, emergency department, we really shouldn't be doing these. So there are a few relative contraindications, and these kind of make some logical sense. So if you have a cervical spine injury, uh, you're going to have to maintain C-spine. It doesn't necessarily preclude you from doing this, but it makes it an awful lot harder. And we'll talk a little bit about probe insertion and how to most easily do that, and that may be a little bit more challenging to do if you have to maintain cervical spine precautions. If you have a history of esophageal surgery, um, depends how far back it was uh, and what the clinical significance is for you to put it in, and that's more of a clinical judgment. Esophageal varices um, obviously can cause bleeding, and that's a risk factor for a probe insertion to begin with. And then um, if you have oral pharyngeal anatomic pathology, so you know if you have someone come in with bad oral trauma, this may not be the best patient to do this in and severe coagulopathy for the same reason we can't necessarily identify um, that we caused a problem um, and the patient is bleeding now down into their GI tract. That's not ideal. And we try to make the best decisions before we put the probe in about who should be getting these studies done. So that being said, what is the risk benefit to the patient? We really have to take an all-encompassing view of this. If we have the ability to see what we need to see with transthoracic echo maybe we don't need to insert this probe. But would we benefit from a constant view of the heart? 
Could we get a better cardiac evaluation? And could we direct or narrow our treatment differential if we had a constant view of the heart while we're undergoing CPR? If the answer is yes, and you think the benefits outweigh the risk, then this is someone who you can consider putting in a transesophageal echo probe. So this is a physician paper put out by ASEP, which is the American College of Emergency Physicians, which is basically an advocating body for emergency medicine. And they put out these guidelines to suggest what our use and utility can be in using transesophageal echo. And the one thing I wanted to emphasize is uh, they put in their paper that this is not just a new skill that you have to use, but it's really an extension of skills you already have. So they gave the example of when we teach people how to do transvaginal ultrasound, we don't make them relearn how to evaluate the pelvic organs on ultrasound. What we're really doing is teaching you how to use the transvaginal probe. And in the same way, you already have skills to interpret the uh, cardiac ultrasound, and we want you to be able to learn how to use a new way of acquiring those images and that information about the heart. So what they recommend and uh, what they put forth is they want you to have a training session with didactics and hands-on training, as well as 10 proctored studies, and that is needed for initial competency. So this gives us a little bit of credence in being able to do this without hitting all the same numbers that uh, the comprehensive doctors are already doing. It gives us some credence in that we already have the knowledge to answer these focused questions that we're going to be answering with a different probe. So just as ASAP was talking about, TEE is really just another probe with the same information that we're trying to acquire. So these should be pretty familiar looking views to you. So they are definitely different, and these are from the TEE probe, but I'm just going to introduce some of these views. So this is the mid-esophageal four-chamber view. Um, it should look pretty similar to what you've seen in the past in your apical four-chamber on your transthoracic echo. This one should also look like a pretty familiar view. This is the mid-esophageal long-axis view. It should look a lot like the parasternal long-axis view that you've seen many, many times. And then this is the transgastric short-axis view. And this is analogous to our parasternal short axis view of the heart. So not long ago, there were only 20 views in the standard comprehensive uh, echo. Uh, that has increased to about 28, like we talked about earlier. But in the ED or critical care, there are three to five views that I think are very valuable. So we're going to be talking about the ones we just introduced, the metesophageal four-chamber, the metesophageal long-axis, and then metesophageal short-axis view. And then there's a paper that suggests that we should also be using the metesophageal bicaval view. And I'm going to argue where we already have the ability to interpret the aorta for our specific focus questions, but maybe we should include this in the transesophageal echo view as well. So to get you a little bit... Uh, more understanding of how we get these views. So as we go through the esophagus um, from the most proximal to down deep into the stomach, we're going to get different views cutting through the heart. So we're going to be focused primarily on the mid esophageal here, um, looking through the heart this way, and then the transgastric, we're looking up through the heart this way. So where the crystals are, are obviously posterior to the heart, and we'll be doing cross-sections through the heart um, back from behind. And we're primarily focusing on these two depths. So this is at our SIM center for one of our trainers, and this is what a TEE probe looks like. So there are a couple components of the probe that I just want to go over the basics so we all are understanding what we're doing when we're trying to move the probe around. So this is the distal tip. Uh, this is where the crystals are and where all the money is. So we've got to get this in the right place to be able to evaluate the structures we're looking for. So this is the flexible shaft. It connects the handle down to the transducer. This is the control housing and transducer controls. And we're going to spend a little bit of time introducing the controls themselves. So the buttons on the side are the multi-plane controls. This actually rotates the crystals within the transducer here. There are two knobs. The top one is the one we're going to be using the most. This knob 
anti-flexes or um, extends the probe forward, or retroflexes pulling the probe posteriorly. And this is the bottom knob. It moves the um, probe transducer to the right or to the left. So all of those controls allow us to move the probe into these different positions uh, and allow for the transducer to be oriented in a certain way. So we'll go through these cardinal movements. So these are the cardinal movements of the transesophageal echo probe. So first up is the advance and withdrawal. So what you really want to do when you advance is stay right close to the mouth and you're ag actually advancing the probe deeper into the esophagus. When you withdraw the probe, same thing, keep your hand close to the patient's mouth and it, retreat the probe back towards you. The next cardinal movement is antiflex or retroflex. So we talked about using the top knob to antiflex, and in this case you're going to rotate the probe clockwise to make that probe come forward in the esophagus or anteriorly. And if you want to retroflex, you're going to rotate the probe counterclockwise, and that will bring the crystals posteriorly within the esophagus. The next cardinal movement is a turn to the right or a turn to the left. This is really going to get us the ability to see the bicable view or the aorta, the descending aorta. So if you want to turn to the right, you're going to keep the shaft of the uh, TEE nice and straight, and you're going to rotate within your hand to the right. And if you want to turn to the left, you're going to rotate the handle of the probe in your hand to the left. This is going to rotate the crystals one way or the other. So the next curl and movement is flexing to the right and flexing to the left. We'll use this a little less, but this is going to be the knob on the underside, so the second wheel. And if you rotate clockwise, it moves the probe to the right. And if you rotate counterclockwise, it moves the probe to the left. And this will probably be our most underutilized movement. And we talked a little bit about the omniplane, but this is going to be able to rotate the crystals forward and rotate it backwards. So this is on our trainer. We can rotate the crystals forward, and you can actually see the omniplane in the top right, and this is how it looks on the screen of all transesophageal echo machines. And it advances um, going up in number here and rotates the crystals within the transducer. If you want to go backwards, you just hit the other button and that should get you going the other direction back towards zero. So let's talk about intubation of the TEE probe. This is really where you're going to need to do the most learning. You already have all the skills to interpret the images, but now we're going to teach you how to do the intubation. So you already have a lot of those skills already as you're an expert in the airway and you've done intubations in the trachea many times, but this is an esophageal intubation um, with a big ultrasound probe. So we're going to make sure you know how to do it safely. So first step, you're going to place the mouth guard um, over the uh, ET tube because we're going to always do it on these intubated patients. Um, and then you're going to have a hole in the middle that you're going to uh, be intubating through. You're going to gently insert the probe into the mouth with mild antiflexion of the probe. You're going to avoid oral pharyngeal dental or esophageal trauma by gently inserting into the posterior oral pharynx and then advance finally down through the esophagus to be able to obtain the view of the heart you're looking for. And if there's no C-spine precautions that you need to keep, you may benefit from having a little bit of neck flexion. This is going to help get that probe down into the esophagus in much the same way that you're putting in a nasogastric tube, a little bit of neck, neck flexion can sometimes help. And then lastly, if you have multiple hands or there are a lot of people in your department helping out with this uh, critical patient, uh, it may be in your benefit to use a laryngoscope to get the probe in um, if you're having some challenges with insertion. It can kind of give you another way of getting the probe in. 
I would recommend doing this with a second provider because there really aren't enough hands to be able to do it all. So here's putting on the mouth guard. Notice that we're putting the ET tube through one of the lateral ports. It'll be on the side closest to the ventilator, obviously. And you have a central hole in the mouth guard that you're going to be placing the transesophageal echo probe through and intubating through. You can see that central hole there. So this is just a demonstration um, of what it's going to look like in the oral pharynx and down in the esophagus of the movement that you're going to be doing. So you're going to insert the probe in through that central hole. You're going to get to the back of the mouth. You're going to antiflex just a little bit by rotating that uh, top knob. And then you're going to slowly advance into the esophagus. There shouldn't be a lot of resistance here, and if there is, there might be a problem with your intubation, and you should rethink the way you're doing it and try again. So here's what it looks like going into the mouth and actually performing the intubation. So you're going to gently insert, and now you're in the esophagus, and you're going to advance all the way to where you can see the mid-esophageal images you're looking for. Okay, so the most difficult part about TEE and something you're going to have to get used to and spend some time learning is the orientation. So we're going to flip the script on what you've been doing with the trans thoracic ultrasound your entire career, and we're going to teach you a whole new way of looking at the heart. So what I want you to think about is we're looking at the heart from the opposite side. So spin yourself around. We're going to be sitting behind the heart, and this is where the transducer lies. And we're going to zoom you in, and we're going to get right to basically where the left atria is. Now, if we get rid of the esophagus and the aorta, we're really staring at the back of the heart here uh, at the um, left atria. So that's going to be the first thing that we see on all of our transesophageal echo from the midesophageal position. So here is the midesophageal forechamber. So um, this has been done a couple of times by putting these red and green bars just to denote which side is what on the screen compared to um, the actual image of the heart on the left. So as you can see, the top of the image here, right where the transducer is, that is the left atria. So if that's the left atria, obviously this is the left ventricle, mitral valve here. The right atria is a little bit difficult to see, but the um, right ventricle is down here. So you get a nice view of all four chambers of the heart, and this is really analogous to our apical four chamber view. So if we rotate to about 120 to 140 degrees with the omniplane, we're getting ourselves into the mid-esophageal long axis view. So we're really getting this view of the heart. Now we've rotated all the way, so now we are seeing at the top of the screen is always the left atria in the mid-esophageal. So this is the left ventricle, the aortic outflow tract, aortic valve, uh, and then this is the right ventricle. This should look very similar to your parasternal long axis view that you're all used to. So if you didn't get that from the three-dimensional views of the heart and having trouble wrapping your mind around, there may be a couple other ways we can think about this. So in the mid-esophageal views, we are really looking through the left atria, like I said. So at zero degrees with the omniplane here, um, the right side of the screen here is really the left side of the heart, right? So these are the left-sided structures here. So if we rotate the probe to 90 degrees, the right side of the screen is going to be superior structures. So this is illustrated nicely in the bicable view. So this is a view of the essentially right atria, the superior vena cava here, and the inferior vena cava here. So the structures on the right side of the screen at 90 degrees of the omniplane are going to be the superior structures. Um, so another way to think about this is if you're looking from posterior to anterior, so your mind's eye is sitting in the esophagus looking through the left atria, the multiplane is actually going to rotate counterclockwise from that orientation. So again, if you're looking at it from the your mind's eye in the esophagus, looking through the left atrium, the multiplane is going to rotate counterclockwise. So the superior structures end up on the left side of the screen. So let's talk a little bit about each of the typical views here. So the first one we're going to talk about is going to be your mid-esophageal four-chamber view. 
So this is analogous, like I said earlier, to your apical forechamber, and the nearest thing to the probe is your left atrium. So left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, and your right atrium is a little bit harder to see. So the way to obtain this view is you're going to advance the transducer into the mid-esophageal position. So you're going through the upper esophagus into the mid-esophagus. And that's going to give you this view right at 90 degrees. And sometimes, actually most of the time, you're going to need to retroflex just a little bit, which is that top knob. So this is just a quick comparison to uh, on the left is your typical apical four-chamber view tr from the transthoracic. The closest thing to the probe here is obviously your apex, your right ventricle, your left ventricle, which you guys all know very well. So. This is the mid-esophageal four chamber. You can gather the same type of information from it. It's just we're looking at it essentially flipped upside down. So here's the left atria, left ventricle. So just nice comparison between the two views. So I want you to start thinking about the mid-esophageal four chamber view as your home base. So when you get lost or you can't figure out where exactly you are, put the multiplane to zero degrees go back to the mid-esophageal area on uh, your advance and withdrawal of the probe and find your mid-esophageal four-chamber view. When you find this, this is our home base. We can get to anything else from here. And most of our views are really going to be in the mid-esophageal. So if you can find this at a multiplane of zero degrees, you're going to be able to easily see the um, three other views in the mid-esophageal area. So the next mid-esophageal window is your mid-esophageal long axis view. So this is very similar to the parasternal long axis. And again, the nearest thing to the probe, as I'm going to say over and over again, is your left atria. So that's really what you're looking through in the mid-esophageal windows. So your left atria, your left ventricle, your aortic outflow track, your aortic valve, and your right ventricle here. This should look really similar to your parasternal long axis view. So again, how to obtain this view? You're going to go into the mid-esophageal position and you're going to advance the multiplane to about 120 degrees. So that varies on the individual's anatomy and can be anywhere from about 110 to 160. So it's going to be a little bit different, but I usually start at 120 and work my way from there. So this particular window is really good for checking compressions um, and compression placement because we're really getting a great view of the sternum coming down towards uh, the heart in this view. And you can see the aortic valve opening and closing, which is really useful to see if blood is moving in the forward direction. So this is just a comparison of what you already know, the parasternal long axis view here on the left with your right ventricle, your left ventricle, your left atria, aortic outflow tract, and aortic valve. You get a lot of that same information here on the mid-esophageal long axis view. Um, so you can really interpret this the same way. And this is kind of rotated uh, about 90 degrees from what you're used to seeing. And then flipped into the mirror image. So the last main view is going to be your transgastric short axis. This will take us through the three main cardiac windows that we're going to evaluate with transesophageal echo. So the transgastric short axis is very similar to your parasternal short axis view that you are familiar with from the transthoracic echo. So the nearest thing to the probe in this case is going to be the uh, inferior wall of the left ventricle. So the closest thing here is the inferior wall. That's uh, in contrast to the most um, closest thing to the probe in transthoracic is really going to be your most anterior structures. So to get this view, you're going to advance the probe into the stomach. So we're going to be way down here. Um, you're going to have the multiplane plane at zero degrees, and you're going to uh, antiflex or bring that probe anteriorly uh, to get the um, angle in the short axis. And you're really going to press against the stomach to allow for that view. So again, this is your transthoracic view of the parasternal short axis on the left and your transgastric, transgastric short axis on the right. 
So you can see you're obtaining very similar information from these. It's great for looking at wall motion abnormalities. Um, you can get a good estimation of ventricular function here, at least in this one plane. And then it's good for looking at you know, high right-sided pressures, which can show some septal deing in the same way we use the parasternal short axis. So there's two additional views I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, the first is the mid-esophageal bicaval view. We mentioned this briefly. So we're really going to be back at the mid-esophageal window, and we're going to twist the probe to the patient's right to be able to see these structures. So this could be a potential fluid assessment window. And then as far as what is on the screen, you're seeing the left atria, like we said, is the closest thing to the probe in all of these. Here's the intraatrial septum. And then the right atria here with the superior vena cava on the right side of the screen and the inferior vena cava on the left side of the screen. Your omniplane, if you notice, is right around 90 degrees to get this view. So just to reiterate, we're retreating the probe if we came from the transgastric back to the mid-esophagus. We put the multiplane to about 90 degrees, and we rotate the probe to the right. So the last view we're going to talk about is the mid-esophageal descending aortic long axis view. So we're really getting a view of the aorta itself uh, in long axis here. So this potentially we can evaluate for aneurysm in the same way we use the transabdominal ultrasound to look for a AAA. And it potentially can give us some more high-level things to consider in the future, such as placing arterial lines, such as Reboa or something like that. So how to obtain this view? We're in the mid-esophageal depth. We're going to rotate the omniplane to 90 degrees if you're not there already. And then you're going to rotate the entire probe handle to the uh, patient's left, and that'll get us the aorta. And here on the screen, you can see the descending aorta here at the top of the screen. This is the um, wall of the aorta here. So let's talk about some TEE protocols. So there are a couple of good papers that came out recently to talk about what we should do in the emergency department. So this first paper is by Fair et al. They basically talked about how we can use point of care transesophageal echocardiography in cardiac arrest. There is a lot of similar language in this to the position paper of ASEP, um, and they propose using a three view protocol. And that consists of the three main cardiac views that we talked about earlier the midesophageal forechamber, the midesophageal long axis, and the transgastric short axis. So they discussed a little bit about why they chose these views. And in large part, they picked it because they wanted to maintain our scope of evaluation of the heart with ultrasound in the ED. Um, and they wanted these views to be anatomically familiar to people who already know how to do evaluation with transthoracic echocardiography. They wanted this to be quick and fast. That's why they only chose three views. And remember, the comprehensive one is 28. So we're using three windows to um, make our evaluation. And then the need for redundancy. We really want this to be reproducible amongst all of our providers. Um, and we want to be able to corroborate these findings in multiple planes. So between these three views, we're really getting a pretty thorough but brief evaluation of the the heart as we see it, and we are able to answer a lot of our focused questions for cardiac ultrasound. So there's another paper by Robert Arnfelt and company. They proposed a four view, and they actually did this, and they trained uh, some of their staff on how to do this on a trainer, and they showed pretty good results. But they did those three views, and they added the mid-esophageal bicaval window, and they thought that was particularly useful for looking at fluid resuscitation. So they talked a little bit about how they came to the conclusion of using these views. So in reality, they, they mentioned that recently interdisciplinary agreement on focused ED ultrasound really has defined our scope of what we should be able to evaluate. And then they basically took out all the windows from the comprehensive exam that didn't really fit our scope of practice. And they're left with eight 
windows, and then they chose four that would be most applicable to our utility for using this technique. So they chose these four views, and here's their trainer views of what they're looking at. So the mid-esophageal four chamber, long axis, short axis, and bicaval. So thanks for joining us for the Game Changer Transesophageal Echo Point of Care Lecture. Just want to bring home a couple of different things. So hopefully this lecture has given you an opportunity to see how this probe is used and get a little bit of your feet wet on actually how to use the probe itself. So this is not so foreign to you when you get going with us at the conference. What I'd like to emphasize is that we are definitely doing a point of care TEE. This is answering the same focused point of care questions that you've been already doing with your trans thoracic echo. This should give you a lot of confidence and in hopping right into this. And ASAP really supports us in that we already have some skills to identify all of the images that we need via transthoracic. And we are trying to replicate a lot of the similar windows that we would get in transthoracic on transesophageal echo to make interpretation much more straightforward. And remember, we are not doing a comprehensive exam like our anesthesia or cardiology fellows, and that's okay. We are trying to guide our management in these critically ill or arrested patients. There's definitely an advantage of TEE over the TTE we've been doing, and we talked a little bit about the advantage of bypassing air, especially in our critically ill or patients under CPR. It really does give us an unobstructed view of the heart in these very difficult cases. TEE safety is of the utmost importance, especially as our professions get off the ground with this. So make sure that you know the contraindications and indications for doing this and be comfortable saying, you know what, this isn't the right patient. We did spend a lot of time going over the probe maneuvers, and I tried to illustrate as best I could on this format how to do these things. Hopefully the videos give you a little bit of insight in how they're actually done, but if you're still a little bit bewildered in how you're gonna be able to approach this, don't worry. We're gonna have trainers for you at the day of the conference, and we will go through all of these views with you. And by the end of it, you will feel much more confident. And then finally, we went through a couple of focused TEE exams for the emergency department that were written by our own colleagues. They really propose a three view or a four view. And we spoke about one additional view, which I think will later be incorporated into our evaluation, which is the long axis descending aorta. So I wanted to put out a special thanks to Menender Singh He's an anesthesiologist at Metro Health who's been working with me to get the TE program off the ground here in Metro. He's also giving you another lecture, which you should have a link to just close by. Um, and he provided me with a lot of the images that you're seeing in this lecture. Um, couldn't have done it without him, so really appreciate all of his assistance. And if you're really interested in doing some extra reading while you are prepping for the course, we talked a little bit about the ASAP guidelines. This thing is basically your golden ticket to be able to do this. It's the support of our um, institution and other emergency doctors to say, you know, this is something that's definitely within our realm. So it's worth a quick read just to make sure you've seen it too. And then these next resources are really getting you hands on for looking at transesophageal echo. Uh, this first one is great. Uh, Toronto uh, Anesthesiology Group put this together, and it really does give like a great view of all the windows in the old 20 view exam, which has all of the five windows that we need for the emergency department. And it really does a really good job of introducing orientation and it uses a lot of the red and green bars. And a quick plug to them, I don't have any incentives or relationship with them, but I did find this to be a tremendously useful resource. It sounds like they're going to need to update it um, to be able to be utilized by our new current browsers, and they're going to need some help with that. So if, if you have uh, the ability to donate to their cause, I think it's a tremendous resource, and if we can keep it around, that'd be really useful, especially for us getting into this. 
the University of Utah Anesthesia Group also put on this great lecture series. They have a wealth of information. And then the ultrasoundpodcast.com guys have done great discussions about transesophageal echo, especially in the cases of CPR and resuscitation. So it's definitely worthwhile. And if you don't have access to one, but your department is looking for a new purchase and to talk about training, I would highly recommend getting these echo trainers. There are many different ones. We have Symbionics. I've used Heartworks. I don't think the trainer is particularly important, but what they're able to do is use three-dimensional haptics to basically show you where you are in space um, and give you a pretty realistic view of doing this transesophageal echo exam. And a lot of them will allow you to do exams in other settings like transthoracic ultrasound. Some of them allow you to look into the abdomen at the lungs and so forth. So it may not just be uh, a purchase for this in particular, but it may be able to be a trainer for just about everything you're doing. Here's a list of our references for this lecture and hope you enjoyed the Game Changer TEE Point of Care Ultrasound Lecture.